That's right, Robert Jones. I am, that is to say, I was a great man. I was born at a rather tender age in the city of Pumfudge, latitude 600, longitude 066. Perhaps you've heard of me? No? Oh, rather pity. Very well, I'll tell you about myself. When I was born, my first act in life was to take hold of my nose with both hands and pull vigorously, thus. This caused my mother, who naturally was present at my birth, to remark to my father, Robert, look, our boy is a genius. Oh, my dear, I weep for joy. Believe me, I weep for joy. Before I was five years old, I had chosen my career in life, namely, nosology. I pursued it avidly. Each morning, I gave my nose a strong pull. In the science of nosology, I soon came to understand that, provided a man had a nose sufficiently conspicuous, he might, by merely following it, arrive at a lionship, an honor much to be desired. My father, who had always been frustrated in his own ambition to become a successful mountebank, determined that I should achieve my goal. I remember distinctly how. Each evening, he would help me with my exercises. One, two, three, tweet. One, two, three, tweet. One, two, three, tweet. Uh, stop. Stop, my dear boy. Now remember, these tweaking exercises give the nose plasticity, character. Yes, Father. Uh, bear in mind, therefore, that the tweak must be vigorous and forthright. Thus. <laughs> yes, Father. Very well. We'll now practice uh, turning up the nose contemptuously. Now observe closely, my boy. Thus. One, two, turn up thusly. One, two, contemptuously. One, <laughs> two. Father. Father. What is it, sir? I thought I didn't know what's the trouble. I'm so... One day, uh, when I had come of age, my father asked me if I would step into his study, and this I did. You wish to speak to me, father? Uh, my boy, it's time that you and I had a serious talk. Yes, father. Uh, first of all, tell me, uh, what is the chief end of your existence? Why, father... To master the science of nosology. That is correct, my boy. And now, uh, can you tell me what is the exact meaning of a nose? The exact meaning. Okay. A nose, my father, has been variously defined by some 6,000 authorities. Mm -hmm. Let's see, it is now exactly three minutes before 12 noon. And we shall have time to get through most of the definitions, I think, before midnight. To commence, then, father. The nose, according to Bartholinius, is that protuberance, that bump, that frow which precedes a man when he's given himself into a life. When I had completed the last of the 6,000 definitions, my father drew me to his side and said, My boy. Yes, father. Your education is finished. Thank you, father. It's time now for you to go out into the world and scuffle for yourself. Yes, father. Uh, tell me, my boy, uh, you know what you must do, of course. Why, of course, father. I must always follow my nose. Exactly, my boy. Exactly. <laughs> So, giving my nose a pull or two right on the spot, I marched out into the streets of Pampanj to seek my fortune. As I made my way up the main thoroughfare, astounded citizens pointed at me with admiration and respect. Is it possible? Unbelievable! Mommy, look! A rhinoceros! Who is he? What is he? Oh! Presence, I blew my nose loudly. Ah, <clears throat> and continued on my way until I reached a fine looking studio bearing a sign which read Signor Tintintino, portrait painter to royalty by appointment to the king and by rendezvous with the queen. I stepped inside, and there was the Duchess of Bableau sitting for a portrait. Behind her stood the Marquis, holding her pet poodle. At her side stood the Earl, supporting the Marquis. 
At an easel stood Signor Tintintino. I approached this great artist and slowly, very slowly turned up my nose. Good. Shocking. What the nose, Signore? How much you take for this nose? I must paint this nose, Mamma Mia. <laughs> One thousand pounds. One thousand pounds? The padre, turn to the light. Eh? With so, pleasure. Uh, oh, I simply must touch it. Oh, May carefully, I? carefully, carefully, madam. This is really a very valuable piece. <laughs> you, you, you show she's quite original. My dear Signor Tintintino, I assure you that I've raised this nose from a tiny little nostril. <laughs> Admirable. I give you one hundred pounds. Sorry, a thousand. A uh, two hundred. Sorry, a thousand. A uh, six hundred. Sorry, a thousand. Nine. Sorry, a thousand. Very well. Good. She's a done. One thousand pounds and I'm gonna paint her this very morning. <laughs> <laughs> This was indeed a stroke of genius. In a week's time, Signor Tintintino's portrait of my nose was hung in the Royal Academy. Overnight, I became a celebrity. I wrote a pamphlet on nosology, and I sent the Queen a first edition, enclosing a reproduction of Tintintino's masterpiece. Why, the Prince of Wales invited me to dinner, and what a dinner! The people who were there, why, every one of them a lion, a giant among men. As guest of honor, I, of course, was introduced around by the Prince. Sir P. Uh, Sir P. Peridog. Your Highness. I should like you to meet Mr. Jones. Not the Mr. Jones, the author of Noses That Made History. Yes, sir, the same. I am honored, sir. You are a man who knows his noses. Thank you. <laughs> Sir P. is being modest. He happens to be a modern Platonist and a lion among men. <laughs> He's also a lion among women. <laughs> charming fellow, charming fellow, but uh, practically no nose, your princeship, no nose. <laughs> oh, here's another chap I should like you to meet. Why, gladly. Uh, Sir Delphinius Polyglot. Sir Delphinius? Uh, your Highness. I should like you to meet... Don't tell me, don't tell me. Let me guess. Pinocchio. <laughs> Droll fellow. Uh, and... Uh, Cyrano. Hardly. <laughs> Why, <laughs> then this... Uh, this must be the Mr. Jones. It is. It is. Yes, indeed, it was quite a dinner. Even Signor Tintintino was there. He discoursed upon Latour and Chambertin. The president of Pumford University made a speech. The eminent archaeologist Ferdinand Fitzelfutelspa spoke briefly for several hours on internal fires and tertiary formations and things like that. And finally, of course, of course, it was my turn to speak. My topic. <laughs> you guessed it, you guessed it. I merely turned up my nose and I spoke of myself. Marvelous, marvelous. Thank you. Clever man. <laughs> superb, absolutely superb. Thank you. The very next morning, Her Grace the Duchess paid me a visit in my apartment. Somewhat plump, but a charming little woman, my heart went out to her at once. You darling creature. <laughs> I know you must simply be thronged with admirers, <laughs> but I said to myself, I must. I simply must meet this fabulous man. And here I am. Why, I'm honored, Your Grace. <laughs> Don't you think it was rather daring of me to come to your apartment, unescorted? <laughs> but then, I've always been one to seize the bull by the nose. And I have always admired a certain measure of boldness in women, Your Grace. Oh, charming man. <laughs> you simply must attend the ball I'm giving tomorrow night. Oh. You will come, pretty creature. Paul, I'm sorry I had promised the Queen. The Elector of Bledinoff will be there. The Elector? I'm not familiar. Not familiar with the Elector of Bledinoff? Why, no. Why, my dear man, he is said to have the largest nose in all the world. Oh, Your Grace. Oh, uh, in Europe, at any rate. Certainly not in England, madame. Please, observe. I admit it does look rather long. Well, it is rather long. Oh, of course. If you come, we can compare your nose with the electors and, and settle the controversy once and for all. Your Grace, I shall be there. You definitely will come. Why, Your Grace, with all my heart. Oh, no, Mr. Jones. With all your nose. <laughs> yes, with all my nose. I uh, had heard of this fellow, that blood enough, 
a pretentious boor from the low country. Well, next night excitement ran high at the Duchess's. The rooms were crowded with suffocation. Wagers were placed. Duels challenged. A thousand pounds on blood enough by a nose. Taken and doubled. I say Jones by ten millimeters. Blood enough. Jones! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I present our distinguished guest from the Low Country, the Elector of Vladinov. <laughs> and now, the British contender, our own Mr. Jones. <laughs> Look, she's going to introduce him. Mr. Jones, the elector of Bloodinoff. You, you call that, that a known fact? Gentlemen, please. Your Grace, I, I sincerely regret this incident, but the mosquito bite which this gentleman dignifies by the title of nose offends me. Dawson, sorry, sir, may I tell you that you're a baboon? Don't oh, no, listen. That, sir, I will not countenance. Have at you. Oh, my second will call upon you in the morning, sir. I gave my pride a twist and sounded my flaxen contemptuously. He who is. Pitiful little blow, and the referee counted off the paces. 28, 29, 30. Fire! The deed was done. I had shut off his nose. Now there was no one in the entire world with a nose equal my own. Ah, my pride, my joy of a nose. I returned to the palace and discovered that a reception had been prepared. Evidently, news of my victory over blood enough had preceded me. I entered and approached the Duchess, but when I reached to kiss her hand, alas, she snubbed me. <laughs> That's all she said. Hmm, your Grace, I don't understand. There is nothing to understand, Mr. Jones. But haven't you heard, your Grace? I won the duel. I shot the elector's nose right off his face. Your presence is no longer required. But won't somebody explain you, sir? What? Mm, Dose. Perhaps you, sir. Noodle. No. But this reception, gentlemen, for whom has it been prepared? For whom, sir? Yes. For whom but the elector of blood enough? <laughs> what? <laughs> I was baffled. Nay, I was chagrined. My nose wilted here. Yeah? Yet the facts were there. I had won. I was the uncontested nose champion of the entire world, yet a reception of honor had been prepared for my defeated adversary, the Elector of Bloodena. Shunned, scorned, carrying my proboscis at a deflected 45 degree angle, I slunk from the court. I appealed to my friend the prince, but all he said was, ah, that's all he said. Things went from bad to worse. My pamphlet on nosology no longer supported me. My portrait was sent back from the royal galleries, and finally, in utter defeat, I returned home to live with Papa. I am home, Father. Yes, my son. Father, I am a failure in nosology. I know, my son. But why, Father? Why? Sit down, my boy. Yes. That's better. My son. Yes, Father. You have learned a sad truth about life. Yes, but what truth, Father? You have learned that a man with a nose more conspicuous than others can be a lion among men. 
Until he overshoots his mark, as you have overshot yours. Yes, but how, Father? My boy, all men have noses. But the Elector of Bloodenoth has no nose at all. And with such, there's no competing. Oh! Surely men accuse me unjustly of being macabre and morbid. I have a delightful sense of humor. If you don't believe me, just listen to another of my tales. This one I have entitled, The Cask of Amontillado. On the coat of arms of my family, the Montresors, is graven Nemo me impune lazese, meaning no one harms me with impunity. The coat of arms itself is a huge human foot done in gold against the field of Asia Blue. The foot crushes a serpent whose fangs are embedded in its heel. I tell you this only so you will understand why I had to act as I did. And while I'm telling you about it, have a drink. A drink of Amontillado, the real thing, too. I know. I know because I have the word of that connoisseur of wine, Signor Fortunato. <laughs> My old friend, Fortunato. The thousand injuries of this Fortunato I had borne as best I could for the years, but when he ventured on insults, I vowed revenge. It was at the height of the carnival season in Venice when I saw him in the crowd, dressed in the costume of a jester. I uh, was genuinely pleased to see him. Hey, Fortunato! Fortunato! I beg your pardon, sir. Hey, Fortunato! Ah, Montresor. Well, 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 my dear friend, I am glad to see you. Well, how goes it, Montresor? Excellently oh, well. I'm having a most wonderful time. I'm in my second childhood, but... I haven't seen you in weeks. I was afraid you were avoiding me. Avoiding you? Never. Good, oh, good. <laughs> but, my friend, you are luckily met. Oh, come over here in this doorway out of the crowd. Hmm? Oh, very well. What's on your mind? Listen, Fortunato. Only today I have received a barrel of what passes for Amontillado wine. Amonti... Not really. Well, I have some doubts. Amontillado? Well, as I say, I have some doubts. <sighs> Amontillado. Oh, when did I last taste Amontillado? <laughs> but I see you are having a little vacation, and therefore I will go to Lucchese. If anyone can tell a good vintage, it certainly is Lucchese. Ah, uh, Lucchese, Lucchese. Lucchese has the nose of a pig. Come, <coughs> let us go. Go? Go where? To your wine vaults. Oh, no, 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 my friend. I couldn't possibly impose. Oh, I insist. No, no. The vaults are damp and you have a bad cough. I will not be swayed. But the vaults are very deep. Your answer. <laughs> you insist? I insist. Very well, my friend. Let us go to the vaults of Montresor. Careful, careful, my friend. These steps are rather slippery. Uh, your vaults are very deep. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Tell me, how long have you been troubled by that bad cough? Oh, it's nothing. Uh, perhaps we should turn back. I won't hear of no, it. No, no, no. I really feel we should. You must be careful. You're a man to be missed, after all. Are you not rich mm. and respected? Beloved by some, my wife. You see, for me, it wouldn't really matter, but for you, no, 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 no. I shall engage Lucas. Enough. I shall not die of a little cough. <laughs> well, if you will not be deterred, at least let me offer you a drink of Medoc. Here, we will select one of these bottles. Look. Look at that dust. Fifty years old. Here, drink, my friend. <sighs> Good. Will you not join me? Very well. I drink to those who are buried here. Buried? Oh, yes, my ancestors used these vaults as a dungeon. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> to your long life, my friend. Ah, now come, let us proceed to the Amontillado. One moment. Yes? Do I hear water? <laughs> yes, we are under the river now. 
Why, is the moisture perhaps too much for your cough? <laughs> I shall survive. <laughs> Montrezor. Yes, what? What? What is that? Hanging, swinging slowly to and fro in the passageway ahead. Oh, that? <laughs> Nothing, just a skeleton. Uh, a skeleton? Yes, my ancestors, you see, uh, very vengeful people. Careful now, careful, don't bump against it. <laughs> Is it... is it much further to the Amontillado? Just a few steps. <laughs> hey, oh, 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 come, 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 to the archway ahead. Here we are. This chamber? Mm -hmm. I see no Amontillado. Patience, patience, you shall, my friend. But first, permit me to point out the interesting architectural structure of this cell. As you see, it is circular, completely circular with a very narrow doorway. Yes, yes, yes. The Amontillado. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado, in a second. And over there are chains stapled to the wall to fasten about the waist of the victim. <laughs> Let me show you. Uh, step over here, please. Montrezor, th this is all very interesting, but... Just a moment now. Just a moment. Stand still. Just... <laughs> Very interesting, but now, if you will remove them... Of course, my friend, of course, I was merely demonstrating... Of course, of course. Uh, strange. <laughs> this key here seems stuck in the lock. Well, perhaps I can work it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny, my friend, if I had to get a locksmith now to saw you loose? Mantras off, for heaven's sake. Oh, now, now, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> here. Here, why don't you have another drink of this made dog? No, 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 the Amontillado. Oh, yes, I forgot, of course. The Amontillado, of course. I'll fetch it. Wait. It's right out here. There. There. Taste it and drink. Well? It is! <laughs> Amontillado! Amontillado. Drink up, drink up. Now, have some more, have some more. Oh, no, oh, no nonsense, really. I... Nonsense, nonsense. One more sip. <laughs> Perhaps one. That's better. <laughs> oh, 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 it makes the head go round and round. Amontillado. <laughs> Doesn't it? Nothing like one last drink. Last drink? <laughs> Before we leave. Oh, but, but these chains I'm wearing. Yes, I know. I had forgotten. I had forgotten. <laughs> Oh, wouldn't it be funny if I had to stay here the rest of my life and drink up all of your Amontillado? <laughs> Very funny indeed. <laughs> Tell me, uh, you don't mind if I do some work while you drink, eh? No, no, go ahead. Thank go you, ahead. thank you. <laughs> what are you doing kneeling in the doorway, Montresor? Oh, I'm just... Mixing up some water. Oh, like baking a cake. That's right, like baking a cake. <laughs> <laughs> baking a cake. <laughs> when do you suppose I'll get these chains off? Soon, my friend. Soon. No hurry. Nothing I like better than to sit here and drink a Montiato and watch you work. <laughs> what are you doing now? Mm -hmm. Now, my friend, I am practicing the art of the mason. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh, I could swear you were laying bricks. <laughs> laying a row of bricks across the doorway. Oh, and I'll have to step over them when I leave. Whoops. Oh, my cup is empty. Empty? Well, wait. I'll get you some more. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Gotcha. Let me go. Yeah. <sighs> Montresor? Montresor? Yes, my friend? Tell me, why do you build a wall of bricks in the doorway? To protect you, my friend. Oh, but if you build a wall of bricks, how am I going to get out? That is exactly the point, Fortunato. You are not going to get out. Montresor! You see, it's quite simple. In a little while, these bricks will come up to your waist, and then to your chest, and then to your eyes, and then... Please, Montresor! I want to get out of here! No. Montresor! Montresor! Oh, nonsense. Drink, drink, my friend. It'll do your cough good. Drink! <laughs> 
<laughs> a very good joke, Montresor. Isn't it? <laughs> Excellent joke. Oh, we shall have many a rich laugh about it at the Palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. Naturally. Uh, Amontillado. Oh, oh, yes. Amontillado. Yes, Amontillado. <laughs> but come. Come, Montresor. Stop playing with those bricks and remove these chains from me. Which chains? <sighs> come. Let us be gone. Yes. Right. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes, for the love of God! Montresor! Fortunato. Hey. Hey. Fortunato. Speak. Speak. You mustn't be dead yet. You mustn't speak. Don't cheat me like that. You couldn't. You couldn't cheat me like that. You you couldn't cheat me like that. You couldn't cheat me like that. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Joseph Schildkraut in a radio version of Three Tales by Edgar Allan Poe. Today's broadcast is part of a series devoted to the classic works of Anglo-American literature. If you're interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And now, our intermission commentator, Dr. Harvey Webster, Associate Professor of English at the University of Louisville. Speaking from Louisville, Kentucky, here is Dr. Harvey Webster. It is the peculiar misfortune of America's first great writer of fiction that he has been reprinted, retaught, and reread so often at his mediocre or worst that few people of intelligence continue to take him seriously after they escape from high school or college. Somehow, Poe's name gets associated with the obvious horror of the telltale heart, with his too many, too unconvincing followers in pulp magazines, with an unhappy, thoroughly neurotic life. This is natural, unfortunate, and wrong. For Poe, at his very frequent and very frequently ignored best, has communicated some experiences more vividly than any other writer of English. His best stories, I believe, are those in which he communicates the pleasure of thinking, of, to quote, that moral activity which disentangles. It is beautiful to watch the minds his mind controls at work. Remember Monsieur Dupin's thoroughly logical explanation of how he knew his friend's unspoken thoughts. Legrand's methodical ingenuity in solving the cipher in the gold bug, the clever quickness with which the old man saved himself from the maelstrom. Anyone that enjoys mental activity has liked or will like these stories. Next best, perhaps quite as good, are Poe's stories of psychological horror. In these two, the moral activity that disentangles is important, though here the disentangling is of abnormal mental states that are, after all, only exaggerations of what we consider normal. To a greater or lesser degree, we all know the second William Wilson. We have all felt something of the fascination with death and decay that becomes Roderick Usher. We have all been attacked by that imp of the perverse that propels the main characters of the black cat to self-destruction. Poe shows what Freud has demonstrated. The abnormal is the normal magnified. Poe's great accomplishment within a limited area, makes us forget his faults and imitators. By a curious law of compensation, what was his misery is our gain. His great powers of intellect survive in spite of or because of his suffering in one of the most distinguished and uneven bodies of work that has been left by a writer of the first order. Our radio version of Three Tales by Edgar Allan Poe, starring Joseph Schilkraut, We'll continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. Thank you. 
Edgar Allan Poe have found life a long and weird catalogue of miseries from which to select my themes. And of all these, the most awful, perhaps, is to be buried alive. Uh, now, don't deny it happens. The boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy. Let me tell you a tale about such an interment. I call it The Fall of the House of Usher. The day was dark and soundless, and black clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens. Toward evening, I caught a glimpse of something in the distance, and I spurred my horse toward it. As we approached, I could make out the hideous outlines of the House of Usher. The house was old, the masonry crumbling. It was built on a rock in the center of a deep tarn or pool of stagnant, rank water. Over all, there hung the atmosphere of a neglected vault of the gloom of the dead. I dismounted from my horse and walked across the wooden bridge that led to the great door. I felt a vague terror rising inside me, a desire to turn back and ride away. As I fought the urge, I found myself reaching into the breast pocket of my coat where lay the letter. The letter which had brought me to the house of Usher. My dear Hugh, this letter will be brief and perhaps somewhat confusing to you because I write from the depths of an upsetting illness. Whatever its merits, please... Please, in the name of our former friendship, do not ignore its plea. I must see you, Hugh, as soon as possible. You are the only friend I can trust in this, my hour of need. I enclose a map directing you to the house of Usher. Your very dear friend, Roderick Usher. And so, I stood now before the huge door of the home of Usher. As I released the knocker, my eye caught a barely perceptible fissure, a crack which extended from the roof down the wall in zigzag fashion to become lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. Yes. This is the house of Usher, is it not? Who asks? Sir Hugh Catlin, a friend of Sir Roderick Usher. Come in, please. Thank you. Uh, my horse Will is... be taken care of. Thank you. <laughs> Good heavens, is the whole house as dark as this? Sir Roderick prefers the darkness, sir. Well, that's strange. As I recall, he always detested the dark. Yes, sir. This way, sir. You will be so good as to wait in this hall, sir. Oh, thank you. I'll tell Sir Roderick. Thank you. I stood outside a dark, carved door at one end of a long hallway. In the semi-darkness, as I stood there, waiting, I felt eyes upon me. And then, as my own eyes grew accustomed to the dimness, I saw, standing only a few yards from me, a young woman in a white, gauze-like gown. For a long moment, we stared at each other. And then, before I could speak, she turned and left, singing as she went. I saw thee on thy bridal day When a burning blush came over thee Though happy met along the way The world was Sir Roderick will see you, sir. Oh, oh, thank you. By the way, uh... Is Sir Roderick married now? Oh, no, sir. Is anyone living here beside himself? Perhaps you'd better let him answer that, sir. This way.
Welcome. Welcome to the house of Usher, Hugh. You're looking well, almost 13 years, isn't it? How are you? I'm fine, Usher. How are you? As you see me. Uh, come. Here, sit down beside me. Well, what do you think of my ancestral hall? Beautiful, but rather dismal with all these hangings and thick carpets. Do you mind if I turn up the Don't, light? don't touch that lamp, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me, I have been suffering with an affliction of the eyes recently. A single ray of light burns my eyes like the noon sun. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. That explains the darkness, of course. And will you have a glass of sherry? Oh, yes, thank you. Here. What, you drink with me? I'd rather not. It's good. Well, uh, come. How do you find me, you? Hmm? Am I not well preserved, still rather handsome? <laughs> yes, time seems to have treated you very well, Usher. Well, I find you. Yes. You were about to say. <laughs> no. Yes, you were about to say you find me altered. Come, come. Yes, I was. How? Different somehow. Different how? Agitated, unnerved. So I, I tried so very hard to conceal it. I told myself I will act very casual and normal. When he comes here, he'll never sense it. What are you hiding, Usher? You let her mention an illness. Oh, nothing, nothing. Just a slight nervous affliction. It'll pass over. Why did you send for me? Because you are the only person I could turn to. The only one who would understand. Understand what? Uh, Hugh, do you recall discussions we had once concerning euthanasia? Mercy killing? Yes. Exactly, yes. We, we spoke of it in school. Uh, you always said you were not morally opposed to it in extreme cases. Are you still of that opinion? Why do you ask? Can you not guess? No. Look at me, Hugh, please. Can you not see what's happened to me? Only that you seem highly agitated. Agit? <laughs> Man, friend, are you blind? Can't you see I'm going mad? Oh, nonsense. Oh, no, 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 not nonsense. This is a family affliction. I watched it destroy my father. Fear of lights? Not just light, my friend, everything. Everything, all my senses have become unbearably acute. You see, the most insipid food, for instance, grates on my taste. A small little sound like the drop of water is thunder in my ears. My skin will tolerate nothing but the softest of silks. Odors, oh, flowers, flowers suffocate me. The closing of a door, music. Why, you, you, you know how I love music. I remember you played the organ, and very well. Well, too. the only musical sound I can possibly tolerate it is this lute here, tuned very softly. You... You've been like this very long? So long I can scarcely remember when I first drew these curtains to shut out the light or when I first hung these drapes to deaden the sound. Usher, when were you last outside this house? I have not set foot outside this house or seen daylight, my friend, for 13 years. Good heavens, man. What you need is to breathe fresh air and see daylight. No. This morbid atmosphere is enough to induce melancholy in a clown. It's no. like living in a tomb. Oh. I know your problems will not be solved so easily. What would you say of a man who cannot take a step outside his own house? I'd say it was... All right, say it, say it. Insane, insane, say it. Usher, there must be some cure for Yes, this. one. What? Death. Death? No. Remember your philosophy. You've thought of suicide. I haven't the strength. I'm even afraid of that. And that's why I ask you to come. I don't understand. I think you do. I asked you here because of your views on euthanasia. You're not asking me to kill you. Exactly. You're mad. I admit that. You're worse than mad. You, if there's an ounce of pity... Usher, listen to me. This desire, this need to destroy yourself is caused by something. Perhaps it's something you've done. You wince at that. Tell me, let me help you. Too late. It's never too late. Confession will be the first step in your cure. You really want to know? I do. You do. Very well. Then follow me. Where do you take To me? the tower wing, it isn't far. What's there? There. There, my friend, is the curse. The curse and the blessing of Sir Roderick Usher. Here. 
Madeline. Who is it? Dear, I want you to meet someone. There is no one to meet. Come here, dear. No. Please, Madeline. It's all right, really. Hugh, this is the Lady Madeline. How do you do? They're... They're prettier in springtime. I beg your pardon? My violets. They've shrunk. It's the darkness. Darkness always kills living things. Do you find it so when you lie living? Uh, oh, well, yes. Yes, I do. Good. Then I'll sing you a song. By all means. Would, would you like a purple one? Oh, any color you say. The blue ones last long. Yes. Shall, shall I sing for you? Do. I saw thee once on thy bright. Oh, come, you come. When it burned. Well, who is she? Isn't she lovely? She's mad. Is this house filled with nothing but madness? I told you we are cursed from birth. She's your wife? No, no. My sister. I see. Do you? I think I do. How long has she been thus? It came upon her gradually. Please come, let us go down. Yes, we did. You see, Hugh, when I went away to school, she was just a delightful little golden-haired child. Why, she worshipped me always. When I returned, she was a woman and I was a man. Hugh, I swear to you, our relationship was innocent and yet, yet that strange love between... Oh, God, God, forgive me. Control yourself. For seven years, seven long years, I've watched her becoming progressively worse, and, and then my own affliction began. Hush. Where there's no sin, there should be no guilt. Tell me, Hugh, is it possible that a man can suffer thus for an uncommitted sin? Such things are not unknown. Now you see why I turn to you. But I am no doctor. I don't want healing. I want punishment. No. If men were punished for their evil thoughts, we would all turn on the rack. Oh. Usher, let me spend a few days here with you. We'll read and talk as we did in school. Mm. I remember your poetry. It was very exciting. Uh, Have you written anything lately? No. no. Well, then, recite the old ones for me and, and play for me. <laughs> Come, we shall fight this melancholy, you and I, and together we shall triumph over it. Thank you. You really like it? Oh, it's really very beautiful. You've improved, really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Why do you stop? Because I realize that I just now smiled for the first time in years. You see, you're getting better already. <laughs> Go on, though. Recite another. Very well. You really want one? Of course I do. All right. I call this one here The Haunted Palace. In the greenest of our valleys by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace reared its head, banners yellow, glorious, golden on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time, long ago. But evil things in robes of sorrow assail this fine estate. Oh, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon it. Desolate. And travelers now within that valley through red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like rapid ghostly river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. No. Someone's coming. Well, I hear nothing. Yes, come in. Well? Sir Roderick, you'd better come at once. Come where? The tower room, sir. It's the Lady Madeline. Good. Ma Madeline, what's wrong? I, I don't know, sir, but you'd best hurry. I'm afraid something terrible has happened. Hmm. Well? 
Well, Usher, why do you stand and stare? She is dead. What? Dead. But, but that's impossible. Why only a few days? Her cataleptic seizure. She is dead from this boy. This time it was fatal. My dear friend. Is there anything I can do? Yes. If you've only to name it. Please help me bury her. After the Lady Madeline had been encoffined, Usher and I alone bore the body to its last resting place. Usher led the way down a long passageway, down beneath the castle and then along a reeking stone passageway. Every few hundred paces we would stop and Usher would unlock a huge copper sheath door. As we passed through door after door, I noticed that the walls were covered with the remnants of the chains and bolts of the Inquisitor. We are here. What place is this? The lowest vault beneath the house. The floor has a strange ring. Yes, it is sheathed in copper. This was once used as a storage room for powder. Please lower the coffin. Very well. There. Help me raise the lid. Usher, in heaven's name. One look, please, one look. Oh, isn't she lovely? See how, even in death, a faint rose tinges the cheeks. Farewell, sister. Beloved sister. Farewell, daughter of Usher. Fasten the lid. Will you not pray? I cannot pray. Then I shall pray. If you wish, but not for her. For whom, then? For me, my friend. Please pray for me, that her image may never return to torture my poor brain. For some days after the burial of the Lady Madeline... A change came over Roderick Usher. He roamed the padded halls of the House of Usher, his head to one side, as if in an attitude of listening. It seemed to me as if his mind were laboring under some horrible, oppressive secret which he was struggling to tell me. His attitude, his listening for some imaginary sound, began to infect me. I found myself doing the same. And as the days went by, I too succumbed to the somber influence of the House of Usher. It was on the eighth day after the entombment of the Lady Madeline. A storm had been brewing. That night I could not sleep. I was overpowered by a sense of impending horror. Then on my door there came a rapping. Who's there? Who is it? Speak up! You... You, I am afraid. I am afraid as no man has ever been afraid before. I show you've been living in this morbid house so long you've become like it. So have I almost. You, I hear something. No, no, I hear nothing. Now you must relax. You please read to me. With my, it, it may take my mind off the storm and off this house. Of course it will. Uh, now you just sit there. Uh, Listen, I'll read from... Uh, the Tryst of Sir Lancelot, mm. all right? Yes. Yeah. Are you listening? Yes, go on, please. Ah. Uh, go on. And Ethelred, seeking entry into the hermit's house, uplifted his mace, and striking at the door, made room for his gauntleted hand. And now, pulling sturdily, he ripped it asunder, so that the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood reverberated through the forest. What's the matter, Hugh? Why do you stop? <laughs> I thought I... Heard something. Uh -huh. <laughs> this atmosphere must be upsetting my nerves. Oh, go on. What was it? Oh, <laughs> reverberating through the forest. Now, entering the door, Ethelred saw a dragon of scaly and prodigious demeanor. And Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck the dragon, whereupon it fell with a dreadful shriek. <laughs> the... Merciful heavens! Usher! Usher, did you hear that? Raid. You did hear that, didn't you? Raid! And now the champion. Now the champion approached the wall of the room, whereon hung a great brass shield. 
which in sooth tarried not for his coming, but fell at his feet with a mighty and terrible ringing sound. He was... Usher! Usher, did you, did you hear that? Answer me, did you hear that? Hear it? Yes, my friend. Yes, I hear it, and I have heard it long, many minutes, many hours, many days. I have heard it and dare not speak. You know why? Do you know? I'll tell you. My friend, because I have put her living into her tomb. Didn't I tell you my senses were acute? Now I will tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in her hollow coffin. I heard them eight days ago, yes. And then I heard the rending of a coffin, the grating of the iron hinges of a prison, her poor struggles in that copper archway of the vault. No. And now she comes. You're insane. She comes. No, she comes, I tell you. Haven't you heard the footsteps on the stair? I tell you, this very instant, she stands outside that door. There's no one there. I tell you, she stands outside that door. Her hand is on that latch. Don't you see her? Turn that latch. What? It's it, uh, beloved. Beloved. Madeline. <laughs> For a moment she stood, trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, blood upon her white robes, and then, with a low, moaning cry, she fell upon her brother and bore him to his death at my very feet. From that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was at its fury as I crossed the bridge. I turned... The radiance of the blood-red moon was shining through the widening fissure that cracked the walls of the house from roof to base. And suddenly, there came a fierce whirlwind, and the entire orb of the moon burst into my sight. The mighty walls rushed asunder, and there was tumultuous sound like the voice of a thousand waters. And then, the deep, dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly. <laughs> <laughs>